Hey everyone, this is your favorite radio host, your only radio host and favorite girl, of course, Corinne Lafont, broadcasting to you from the lovely island of Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean on Between the Lines. And you know, I always start my show of being thankful or grateful, whichever, although I know there's a difference between great gratitude, grateful and thankfulness. I think thankful is better. Uh, it's a beautiful sunny day. I'm looking at it. Um, it changes throughout the day, but generally sunny. And um, it just tells us what life is all about, that even if it starts off bright, it may get a little bit dull and then it comes back bright again, sometimes even brighter than before. So I'm thankful to be here. I'm, I'm just thankful to be doing this show. I'm thankful for the impact I'm having on your lives. If I am, I hope so. Even if it's one of you, I am thankful. Um, I don't focus on the naysayers. I only focus on the people whose lives I impact. And eventually the naysayers come around. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so I'm not worried at all. Um, so I have with me today a handsome young man who was on my show months ago. Yes, he pretends to be shocked. He is handsome. <laughs> He was on my show under the Saluting Dads um, series that I had in June for Father's Day. And these guys always tend to come back because he's not the only one who came back on my show. I've had a couple of the other guys come back on. And that's awesome. It means to say I'm doing something good. And they are doing something good. So we are a great match. So his name is Michael Jacquith. And um, what's great about him is everything. Everything is great about him. He's the father of six, husband to a lovely wife. She hasn't come on my show yet, Michael. So we'll have to arrange that and have the kids swing by, you know, just to see what's going on. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> and, um, you know, let me tell you a bit about Michael and what we're talking about today. You know, he's Catholic and um, I am Catholic. So we're going to be bringing a bit of, um, not too much of a religious aspect, but you know, we, we, we need to bring in that sort of spiritual aspect to it. So it's not a matter of pushing Catholicism on you or any such thing, but really life's lessons that we can get from that connection with source, spirit, God, the universe, whatever you may want to call it, him, her, whatever it may be. Yeah, just know the whole thing is really to recognize that there's somebody, something, someone that is higher than you, something that's pulling the world, that's keeping the world together. We really don't care what you want to call it, him, her, whatever, what name or label you want to give it. Just recognizing that there's something bigger than you out there. Yeah, and that's keeping things together because you certainly aren't. So, so let me tell you about Michael. So Michael Jacquith was born in Northern Michigan. He received a PhD, so we should actually call him Dr. Michael, in analytical chemistry from Cornell University and worked in semiconductor research for many years. Whoa. He left that career behind, imagine that, and now is a small business owner and speak on self-help development and the Catholic faith. And with six children. Oh my goodness. Welcome, Michael, to Between the Lines. Kareen, thank you so much. It is a pleasure again to be speaking with you. We had an awesome conversation last time, and I have been looking forward to this conversation for a long time now. Thank you again. Yes, yes, it's great to have you, and thank you for being a repeat guest. That is absolutely awesome. I have a number of guests, like I was saying, besides you guys on the Salute and Dad show, you know, the series that people are just coming back on, and they're like, I need to get back on your show. I love what we're doing, and <laughs> I'm like, well, it's good stuff. Yeah, it's I'm like, conversation. yeah, I'm like, do what you got to do if you want to come back on, but it won't be until 2019. And the looks of it now, it's like, I think it's February or so, 2019, you know, people are booked up until, you know, in, far ahead in the future. And I remember one person complained, if I could call it that, well, you need to have your shows closer together. I'm like, yeah, that's what it is. But people are just booking them that I have no control over it. It's far ahead, so you got to work with it. I have no control over that. So it's good. It's good. And I'm happy to, to get that kind of feedback. So, so Michael, we're talking today about marriage is a merger. And like I was saying to you off air, 
I have been listening to R.C. Blakes, and of course he's getting mentioned on my show. He would love that. R.C. Blakes Jr., a, a pastor. Um, I, I, he works in New Orleans, I think. I, I know he has something there. I'm not sure where else he operates. But he, um, I have been led to his YouTube channel because and what I love about him is that he is very spiritual and, and no, let me, let me go back a little bit. He is, he is a man that has lived life in his early years. He has made mistakes. That's what I love about him. He's not Jesus return who, you know, I'm pretending to be all that. He has made mistakes. And when he speaks, it is coming from a place of experience. And there's nothing more, I think, that could resonate with somebody than a man with experience. It's like, oh, you have six children. And, you know, it's, I cannot speak to that. I have two. I, <laughs> you, I, I have to sit down and listen to you as a man of experience with six children and raising a, a family, running a business. I, I can't speak to that. That is you. So he has been through a lot you know, what he volunteered for, what he didn't volunteer for. And um, because of that, he comes from a place where he's telling you, look, I have made mistakes. I know what it is. I, I've been there. I'm still there, you know, in some aspects. And this is me. Uh, and I'm teaching you this, you know, I've changed my life. And, you know, I'm showing you the path because this is a better part. And he quotes from the Bible and he shows you practical and he brings it right down. And he said the other day in one of the videos, because I listened to so many, he spoke about, he said something that I think was a major statement, marriage is a merger, it's not an accomplishment. You know, people, people feel, oh, I'm married now, so I'm accomplished. You know, it's like, yay, I've reached success. No, marriage is not an accomplishment. He was saying, and I decided I'm going to have that discussion with you since you're married and you talk about marriage and you're Catholic. And um, he says, once you've gotten into being married and, you know, you've spent years and you've realized, yes, you could say, yes, you know, the whole marriage, being married, um, you have accomplished that in the sense of it has lasted for so many years and how it has been and how you have gone, gotten over the challenges and the hurdles and stuff. But just the sake of being married is not an accomplishment. It's a merger. And I want to I wanna talk about that. And when he said it, I thought about business. You know, people who do mergers in, in real business come together and bring one company to another and decide why should these two companies or three companies come together? What it is. So I want to talk from a business perspective, bring that sort of lateral perspective to the discussion in the sense of you being a business owner, we may not be equipped to speak on how a merger happened, but we have an idea. And why, why would he make the statement about marriage is a merger? What is synonymous with business and marriage that, that he says it's, it's a merger? So let's, let's take it from that angle. What happens in business that, that we can learn, you know, as single people, because I'm single and I'm talking to a lot of singles, who run into marriage and feel, oh yes, now that I'm married, you know, I, I've accomplished, I could tick it off my, my checklist. It's not like that. We have to take time because when, when in business they're doing a merger, they don't just look at the other company and say, yes, let's get married. No, <laughs> they, they would have looked at certain criteria, certain things, you know, over the years in order to decide, do we match? Would we make it? Does it make sense? You know, all those different things in the business world. So I want you to, to talk about that and, and show the listeners and the watchers why really, if you agree that marriage is a merger. I think, I think there's a lot of ways which I do agree that marriage is a merger. When I worked for Intel, we actually, I, I had some visibility into the discussion about doing a merger with Micron at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I, I kind of saw what they were thinking about. And, and you're right, a merger is not a one and done kind of deal. You don't just pop up one day and says, you look nice, I'm going to merge with you. And then you go out the next day about your business. It's both a great deal of thought that goes into it, but it's also, and I think this is a deeper similarity, a great deal of work and a continuity going forward. You know, when you take 
two different cultures. And, and actually, it was neat. I worked both for Intel and Micron. I was on both sides of this getting some visibility. The cultures are very different. And, wow. and that merger never actually happened. But if it had, I can imagine where you have these radically different cultures trying to day after day adapt to get by, to learn how the other side of the equation ticks and what is it that makes them work. And, and I think too, an, another great analogy here is when you truly have a merger, it's not like fifth, it's not like it's just a, I'll kind of give a little bit here. It's, it's a hundred percent all in. Mm-hmm. 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 I longer heard a great line about marriage that if you approach marriage by saying, I'll change 50% and she'll change 50% and oh. we'll meet in the middle, you're in yeah. trouble. No, no. The right answer is I'm going to change a hundred percent. She's mm-hmm. going to have to bend hundred percent and it's still going to be a challenge even with that much bending over. <laughs> I think that's a good way to look at it there too in the business. The businesses are all in and it's going to take time to sort it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like those two points that you made. And that is, that is exactly, you know, what I guess he was pointing to and hinting at. You can't, you can't expect to seek the other half of you. You come in with 25% and you're looking for 75 from the other person or 50 and you're looking. No, you must be in, you must be whole. You must be already operationally efficient. You can stand on your own. You, you, you were successful by yourself. You, you don't even, you weren't even looking to, to, to find someone to be married or merge with. You were good. You were good. And then another company decided, hey, or probably the environment dictated that, hey, it makes sense for us to merge because we have synergistic relationships. We can become more powerful as a combined unit than, than singularly competing in the same industry or environment. So it's, it's, it's a hundred and a hundred. It really is. And I, I want to add one thing to what you just said. When you said you have to be standing on your own, I agree with that. You know, I, I've gone through a lot of marriage books and my wife and I, in order to keep our marriage healthy, we regularly go through marriage programs together, retreats, and sometimes even counseling as it's needed. And that's something that, you know, I think a lot of men I know don't like doing, myself included. It's not mm-hmm. particularly fun, but you got to be there. But one of the things we've learned is that we do have to be able to stand on our own, that you can't just be entirely dependent functionally on your spouse. Now, that's not to say you aren't a team, mm-hmm. but I need to be able to stand tall, be able to say I'm in charge of myself, mm-hmm. and I can the, – the, the opposite is a term I heard once called emotionally fused, where when – my spouse becomes angry, I automatically become angry because I'm so fused, I can't be in charge and control myself, mm-hmm. if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and you made the other point, which I didn't even think about when I, when I crafted this topic for discussion about cultures, because that is significant. We both come from different backgrounds, socialized differently. And I didn't even think way out at the time about people who are marrying from different cultures. You, you are American, I'm Caribbean, there may be somebody from Asia. We do t- things differently, we speak differently. We, you know, things have different meaning for us. And just that in itself is a big hurdle. The whole Absol- thing about cultures. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think the first year of marriage is nothing but one unending discovery of cultural differences after another. And, and it doesn't need to be as dramatic as a nationality difference. My wife and I are both from some similar socioeconomic classes here in the U.S., but we discovered from early on we have totally different views. I mean, the very first Saturday after our honeymoon, in (laughs) my family, Saturday morning's a working day. You get up early, you get your butt moving, you start working. In my wife's family, Saturday morning was a relax, drink coffee for a couple hours, get to know, connect to people. And so I want you to vision this scene here. Like we're literally, it's our first weekend after our honeymoon. And I wake up at six thirty in the morning. I'm like, all right, I jump up, I make my breakfast, I get myself dressed. And I'm about two hours into a project when my wife lazily strolls, not lazily, but this is just her culture, out of bed, in her pajamas, walks over, starts making a cup of coffee. And she's like, how are you doing this morning? Let's talk about how we're doing. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm already in a project here and, and we both meant it well and we laughed at it, but it's, <laughs> there's these cultural differences, even within, I'll say, seemingly similar starting points, mm-hmm. it just be quite a shock. Yeah. And to, and to decide, you know, coming back to the whole business of, of merging, 
the company, one company, company A, company B, company A has been, has been, as I said, operationally efficient. They already decided what their culture is. Company B has their own, and then now you decide to merge up. It's confusing to everyone, staff, everybody. They're like, how are we, you know, it, it creates anxiety. So these are all the things that, that potentially and does happen in marriages as well. It creates anxiety, um, fears, um, you know, disorientation. You wonder, would you be rejected? Because you may have started a discussion of a merger, which is synonymous to marriage, or you feel that's where it's going. And it ends up not going there because you realize, hey, we thought this made sense, but this doesn't make sense anymore. <laughs> Yeah, no. oh, you're absolutely right. And I, I think we, we see that a lot. I think there's a, I don't want to say this gently, there, there's a part of marriage, which it's incumbent upon both spouses to fight against that exact fear. And, and you can be married, you can have the paperwork signed, but still a fear that sometimes lives in your heart is, would my spouse choose me again? Am I still the choice, the love of their life? Like, would they, because as marriage goes on, you, you lose that early passion, that early you know, over the top romance, everything's amazing and butterflies. And as those years go on, it's incumbent upon us spouses to really affirm our spouse as our primary choice, just to say to them in a real way, and I think guys struggle with this even more, to say, no, no, I love you. And if I could do it all over again, I would do it all over again. And I still choose you. And I still, you know, you are still worthy of the merger with me, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, that, that whole affirmation. And, you know, um, it's, it's, it's very interesting, a merger coming together. We haven't even spoken about resources, which is also a tricky, a, a tricky part to it as well. Because one company kind of say, okay, I'll merge with you. Um, yeah, um, but I'm not giving anything. I'm not sharing what I have over here. You, you know, a merger cannot operate like that. It's a sharing, giving taking of resources Absolutely. How, how would you see that in in, in the marriage I, I think you know he, here's i'll say a popular example of where that fails to happen i know a lot of guys who really love computer games now i played a lot of computer games myself so i'm not trying to speak poorly about computer games here or, or console games or video, whatever the flavor of video games you have but and that's fine but here's how this plays out though they get married and at first, they still have time to take care of their wife and play their video games. But as time goes on, they have a child, maybe a second child, maybe even a third child. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, it's a different story. And, and that time isn't there. And this is the moment of decision for this guy. He's got to say either, A, I'm going to give all of myself and I'm going to let go of this computer games, which has probably been with him for 20 years as a serious, serious hobby or whatever. I'm going to let it go because my family needs me. Or he can say, no. Nope, this is more important. I'm refusing to share this part of my life. And the latter, it is not a healthy way. <laughs> no, it isn't. No, it isn't. But is there a balance? Is there a way in that merger that you can still have a part of you? Because you don't really want to lose you. And, and that's all about being in a merger as well. You don't really want to lose yourself, give up what, what you enjoy, you love, just because... Oh. You're, you're in something with someone. Absolutely. It is about balance. And it's, you know, I think the, a practical step here might be, I know a lot of couples, what they do is they make a budget and in their budget, both financially and on their calendar, in the sense, they outlay a certain amount of money and a certain amount of time for each individual to spend on themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. I think as long as there's a balance there that you and your spouse sit down and say, yeah, we can afford 300 bucks a month, whatever, for each person to have for fun money. And we're going to arrange that each, each person has, you know, one or two evenings to themselves where they can do whatever they need to do. Great. That's all there. I, I think you can have that discussion. And, and in a healthy marriage, I want my spouse to be able to still do the things they love and the things they enjoy. Mm. But it's, I have to be willing that if I'm, I'm going to go back to my computer game example, my video game example. And if I see my wife is losing it, trying to chase around three kids around the house and pulling her hair out, and I'm sitting there on the couch playing video games, it means I got to turn in that moment. I got to turn that thing off get up and help her. Yeah, but some don't. Some don't. Some don't. Some, some lock themselves in the room and close off, close off to anything that's happening outside of the room. So, you know, 
they are, they are Absolutely. Closer to their own world. But coming back to that point you were making about the sharing of resources and budgeting and, you know, that, that sounds good, but there'll be the persons who will be like, that sounds like, you know, kind of um, stiff, kind of rigid. I, I want to be able to, I don't want to do anything about our budget. Um, you get this, I get this. When I feel, I don't want to do, I don't want to do this on this day and that day. When, when I want to feel to do something, I do it at this particular time. This is my passion. This is, this is what I love. And, you know, I don't want to stop the other person from, from doing what they love. Um, because to me, that, that's, that's like taking away their soul. I, I don't want to schedule someone with what, what their passion is. I should be a part of that. I should be a part of that and, and welcome me into that. Help me to learn. Help me to understand what, you know, why is this your passion? So, for example, I know guys who spend lots of money behind photography, thousands of dollars behind particular cameras, and these things are money making as well. It can be a, it's a business for them. And, you know, there are some guys who are into um, remote control kind of, uh, what do you call those things? Racing. They enter mm -hmm. competitions and things like that. Um, that is fun for them. And, and if you look at the other side, you know, you have to say to yourself, well, what would you prefer? Me being in a bar? I mean, it might be a way of justifying, you know, well, he's doing something productive, constructive. At least he's not in a bar. He's not running down on the woman. So you kind of use that sort of reasoning to say, which would you prefer, this one or that one? So you're like, oh, well, he's doing photography, he's doing car racing, you know, that's pretty okay, I don't mind. Even <laughs> to kind of ease yourself and, and bring some sort of comfort, um, even though it may be taking away some time. But to me personally, it's like, as a woman, I would more want to be involved in what he's doing. So if he's into car racing and photography, I'll say, honey, let me, you know, I, I want to be involved in that. Tell me, you know, what it is, you know, let me be a part. For me, I love dancing. So I would want the guy that, that is coming into my life to appreciate um, my dancing. He, he, he should not want to stop me from dancing. Latin dancing is a passion for me. He's, he's not going to stop me from doing it. He will not. He will not stop me from doing it. And if, he, if I sense he is, then he needs to be out of my life from the beginning. It, the merger cannot work. Because nobody's supposed to come into your life to schedule or stop you uh, or curtail you. And it happens subtly, you know, um, Michael. You know, little, little over time you realize, wait a minute, I'm not dancing as much as I used to. I'm not feeling that joy. No, 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 no. no. Nobody's supposed to take away that joy from you. They met you that way. Um, so I don't know what, what's your take on that. I, I think, I think there's a lot of what you're saying, which I do agree with that the best marriage combination merger really allows each spouse to participate in the joys of the other. Mm -hmm. And it's a, the healthy way is, you know, in my particular case, I love camping in the outdoors more than my wife does. And, and she loves drinking coffee on a Saturday morning. And we've tried as our marriage progresses to learn to participate and join the other mm. in the act and maybe we discover new things we do love and she over time has found parts about camping that she likes and yeah. and i have found parts of the connection saturday mornings i like mm. but i think there's a different part i do want to bring in here which is even i'll say the non-marriage secular entirely focused advice out there really oftentimes these business these uh, self-help gurus will go on and on a great length about the value of being intentional and scheduling and how when we do that, it doesn't actually diminish what we're doing. To schedule something is not to take away from it. To schedule something is actually to prioritize it. Okay. When I schedule something, let's say, you know, I, I see you right now in my mind twirling with your Latin dance, and I come up to you, <laughs> and, and in this moment, I'll pretend as if I were your husband. I'd say, Kareen, you are the best dancer of all time. We must make it happen. Now I know we have children and we have obligations, but we're going to put this on the calendar for every Wednesday night so you will get your dancing on Wednesday night and we'll make it happen. And that way, if something comes up, we both know we don't schedule other things Wednesday night. I know that I'm going to take care of the children on Wednesday night. And when I schedule this for you, I'm not saying you can only do this thing here. What I'm saying instead is it's so important to me that I want to make sure it gets done because I see how important this is. Yeah. You see the difference I'm trying to drive out there? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, that's really a better, a better way of putting it out there to post on so that they don't feel that, oh, you're only giving me this particular time to do this. It, it, it sounds so rigid. 
you know, as opposed to because the joy in you doesn't have a time. It doesn't have a clock. Absolutely. It doesn't, it doesn't have a clock or a time. Um, but in terms of prioritizing, giving your other responsibilities. And it's, it's just like a class because when I'm doing my Latin dancing, my classes are scheduled. There are certain days and there are certain times and, you know, you show up for class. But of course, outside of that, you have your practice sessions because you're only doing it probably once a week. So you have to have the practice in order to, to solidify and cement what you learned in the class. And of course, you have your social dances, which allows you to go out on the, on the dance floor. You know, social get-togethers where people put on parties, Latin parties. So that really gives you the practice. So, there's, so for me, my life is so fluid. A guy coming into my life, he has to fit into that. He cannot say, well, you only have Wednesday. No, I have dancing Monday to Sunday. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I it's more gradual than that, too, though. It's also... You, oh, you I'm have sorry. To... Hold on one second. Oh, I something ahead. just popped up on my radio. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I have dancing Monday to Sunday. And so, you know, it's it's... He has to be, I think for, for me, he has to be that person that fits into that life for him to really appreciate and understand the joy and the love that I get from it. I, I think I told her where you're coming from and, and I think the right husband will come up to you and say, I want to be part of this and I want to engage in it. I think there is a, a balance point I think is found particularly with children. And as you said, you got two children, you understand how it's sometimes challenging to, to do it all when you have the children. And so it's about balance. And, you know, I'll just use a personal story for myself. And, you know, when I first was married, I still played computer games a lot. I played a lot of them. And <laughs> after the first baby, what I found was I found certain times I could do it, but it wasn't at once. And what I eventually found was that my time I spend with my children as they get older, mm -hmm. in some ways, filled that same niche I used to have. And it's not like my wife ever said to me, she never said, you can't play computer games. Mm -hmm. It's that I stepped back and I looked at the situation. And I said, you know, we now have, at the time I were actually, you know, pretty much stopped. We had four kids. Mm -hmm. And I said, we've got four kids now and I can sit up here and do this. And I still, even now do maybe, you know, a little bit here and there, but then, or this value I get, and there's this choice that I make saying, I want to spend this time with my family. I want to spend this time to help my wife because, because I love my wife and so I want to give to her. And so one way I give to her is getting down there to be with the kids, to tumble with the kids. And you know what will happen is I'll watch the kids and my wife likes baths. And so she'll go take a hot bath with a bath bomb. And, mm -hmm. and then after that, then maybe you know, we'll put the kids to bed and then I'll go play an hour computer games. But we, instead of being a, I want this for myself, it becomes what can I do for my spouse mm -hmm. to give them what they want the most? And when both couples approach it from yeah. that way, yeah. it doesn't feel like you're giving anything up. Yeah. I, I heard once that the only competition that's okay in marriage is the competition to outdo the other in acts of generosity. But yeah. any other competition, any other that's score right. you keep saying, well, you got mad at me three times and I only got mad at you two times. All yeah. that stuff is just purely destructive. I love that. I need you to repeat that. I needed to repeat that. Come again with that statement, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is so key. The only competition, the only score that you can ever keep in a marriage that's healthy is the competition to outdo the other in an act of generosity, to yeah. outdo the other in giving. Yeah, yeah. That is key. If, if anyone listening to this or will be listening to this and you, you don't take away anything else, that is a big takeaway, the act of generosity. And I think people have lost that completely, completely. And they have forgotten why they got together, why they fell in love, why they, why they are merging. And it's more a blame, blaming, you know, shifting, you know, shaming, unnecessary. Totally Absolutely. Unnecessary. Yes, as opposed to outdoing each other in acts of generosity. So you're coming from a place of love. You're coming from a place of giving as opposed to looking to give to get in return. You're not looking to get back anything. You're doing it unconditionally, unconditional love. You're not doing it to get back something. That is awesome. That is awesome. And you see, that's, that's the thing, I guess, with mergers, you know, um, mergers and acquisitions and all those things too. They're, they're looking to, to, to bring, to come together, to make things more powerful. 
to make things better, not worse, not more drama, you know. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's really to be more efficient, more effective, you know, in, in, in what they're doing, which is why they, they, look, they look at the other company, company A looks at company B and vice versa and decide this will make sense. Wow, this, this is awesome. And then when children come in the, in the making, because we're just talking about the two adults here, but when children come in the making, it puts a different spin on things now, Michael. Help us to understand how, how the, the, the merger, when you start to have children, what, what would you call that now, subsidiaries? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I think that if I were to use this analogy, what I would say is that if you merge two companies, you start having children, it means the merger has been so fruitful that you now have, say, new products, new technologies you're rolling out, and you become, from a business perspective, you become much more profitable in that scenario. Mm -hmm. But it is more crazy. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> and as that craziness goes up, you know, there's, again, so much of it comes down to basics, the business basics, the marriage basics, communication, yeah. managing expectations, uh, making sure that everyone's aligned. You know, you know, Kareen, I find one of the biggest frustrations in my marriage and others I see mm -hmm. is when my expectations aren't met. If yeah. I expect that something's going to happen and it doesn't happen, I actually get upset. But yeah. if I had not expected that, well, exactly. I would barely be upset at all. That's yeah, right. It's so critical that we use our communication chain so we understand that I say to her, are my expectations reasonable? And she might say, no, they're, they're not. We need, how about this instead? And then we adjust our expectations. I yeah. think that's so true in business too. I had a great manager when I worked for Intel and he would just drive this point home again and again and again that whether we're dealing with an internal customer, an external customer, dealing with a partner, whatever it is to provide very clear expectations, very clear communication about where we are, where we're going, what we're going to do and how we're going to get there and when we expect that to happen so that everyone's on the same page because otherwise when we don't have those what started off as an innocent miscommunication can soon be perceived as an assault like especially in marriage you see where you know maybe i expected that i would be going camping this weekend just to mm -hmm. pick an example mm -hmm. and I hadn't talked to my wife about that and she had made expectations that we were going to be going and visiting some in-laws that weekend. Well, yeah. we just didn't communicate about it. But the day yeah. comes and Friday shows up and I start throwing the sleep bags in the car and she's like, why are you bringing sleep bags to the in-laws? <laughs> why, why are we going to the in-laws? And You're camping at the in-laws. You can do that. You can merge the two things, Michael. <laughs> you can camp at the in-laws. Okay, maybe that's a bad example then in that case. But, <laughs> but had we just talked about it early on, we would have made a decision and we said, oh, great, we'll go camping this weekend and go to the in-laws the other weekend or whatever, or whatever the decision is. But then we're aligned. Then we have the same expectation. And then it feels like we're on the same team. The thing, the thing I, that came to my mind in terms of the subsidiaries, which is equivalent to like the, having the children, you know, new products and stuff, is how do you, first to begin, when we merge, we had that challenge with the culture, with 100%, 100%. But now there are children you know, new products we're bringing out. How do we decide which products we're bringing out, how we want, to, how we want the products to look, to behave, to, to be received, you know, um, how we want to grow it, you know. Then there's another cultural challenge there. Um, and you start the process all over again. How, how we want to see this product grow, the direction, um, the features we want this product to have. Um, or this new company that we're forming that will be part of the, of the bigger picture. You know, the, the, it, so it's a, it's, a, it's a continuously evolving, challenging type of thing. Amen to that, sister. It is <laughs> continuously evolving and challenging. Yes. So one thing as you're talking right now that I thought of too that I think is really important is in a marriage and in a business, when you have children in a marriage, your first priority cannot be to those children, it has to be to your spouse. And that's very hard, especially for mothers, I think. Uh, mothers with a baby, it's very, very hard for them to choose their husband over their child. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't come up often, but there are moments where it does. But in a business, it's the same way. If you're a business and you've done this merger and you have your core products and you launch off some new product line, some new whatever little project it is, you've got to remember what, where your bread and butter is coming from. Yeah. And it's easy in a business, and I've done this before, to launch 
a new idea and say, this looks amazing and start putting all your resources behind this new project, this new idea, this new product, whatever. And you forget that you've got to take care of your core functionality. You know, you got to take care of what you do at, a, at, the, at the center first. And that has to always be the first priority. Wow. That's a, that's a different spin there, Michael, because you're absolutely right. Um, mothers in particular, because of their nurturing um, DNA, we are built like that. You know, we tend to live like, and I was telling a girlfriend of that last night, you know, I said, you stop living for the children. You have to live for yourself. Children grow. They have their own personalities. I'm not saying to forsake your children now you know, your responsibilities, but you do what you must, <coughs> sorry, as a parent, but you have to take care of you. You have to take care of the person that you're with. Now, my friend is a, a single mother, but you have to take care of you. So whether you're a single mother, that merger is no longer and you separate or you're still in a merger, which is a marriage in this case, you have to, you have to spend time with, with, with your spouse. And I have friends who are still married and I encourage them. I said, are you spending time with your husband? Are you spending time with your wife? I encourage them. I said, please don't focus your life all about the kids. They grow, they move out. And then both of you are left there looking at each other, wondering what, what are we going to do now? Then you, you're lost. You, you suddenly, you know, when you were sort of, I don't know, time capsule where you're like, we don't have anything in common. We, we you know, everything was all about the kids. Who are you? I, what's your name? I, I, I can't remember you. You know, that sort of a thing. You start looking at your wife, your, your wife looking at you and both of you all suddenly realize you have nothing because what you had in common is gone now, left the house, living their own lives. And now you're there in a big house, not knowing what to do for yourself, as opposed to spending time growing learning about each other, being in each other's lives and still, yeah, taking care of the kids, not forsaking that, but don't forget you and don't forget your spouse. And, and it's important for your children, the subsidiaries, your products to, to see that, Hey, the core is still there. The, you know, we're, we're, we're still, it, it sets an example for the new products to see. This is how we operate. So you need to take an example from this. You know, as you're saying this, I'm reminded, uh, my wife and I have gone through the Tony Robbins marriage program. And one of the points he makes there is that every human being in the deepest part of their heart is longing for this unconditional love, this connection of a loving connection with another person. And a lot of parents, both, both mothers, obviously, but even also a lot of fathers, seemingly sillily, silly, whatever, try to make that connection be with their children. Mm -hmm. which is crazy because we all know intellectually those teenage years are coming and what feels now when they're little, like an unconditional love, we know it's going to change. Like there's no confusion in any of our as parents mind that we know how crazy that's going to get, mm -hmm. but we still do that when right next to them is our spouse who is the right vessel to try to build this connection of, of unconditional love with. And it's not that it's easy, but that's the connection to, to focus for that outlet because this, this is a craving of the heart and every person has this craving in their heart. I want to be loved. I want to be connected. Yeah. I want to matter. I want to be with you. And, and you have that little kid there and it's, it's easy because they're so dependent upon you that at first it feels like I can't lose. I'll get that from them for sure. Mm -hmm. But, but we know it's coming. Like they're going to become teenagers. They're going to become snots and then eventually they're going to leave. Yeah. Even if they're great teenagers, they're going to leave. So instead rather than allowing your heart to be so tied to your children, we as spouses have got to remember that that unconditional love can't come from the kids. Yeah. That deepest relationship cannot be based on them. It has to be based on the spouse. Yeah, yeah. It started there. It started there. It didn't start with the kids. It started with the spouse. Absolutely. So you have to go back again, just like we said at the beginning, to the source. Go back to the source. Go back to the source. Don't forget where you started. Go back to the source. You all started this together. So you need to end it together. Yeah? Absolutely. Merger. Marriage is a merger. You're not in it just for temporary. You're in it for life. You're in it for life. Um, you, you didn't go in. Well, if you are going into it with a sort of temporary thing, then don't go into it at all. It and that is a... 
that's I think one thing where mergers and marriages do differ a little bit is, you know, a, a merger is a contract, but a marriage is a covenant. What that means is it's yeah. for life, yeah. for sure. I love that. That's a great way to end it. A merger is a contract, a marriage is a covenant. Big, big difference there, people. Big, big difference. And for those who didn't understand what a covenant is, kindly explain to them what a covenant is. Absolutely. Uh, a covenant is, it's an older idea. It's something that we don't think of as much anymore. It's yeah. this idea that I give everything I have and everything I am and all who I am, I give to you and you give everything you have and all that you are and all that you have to me. Mm -hmm. And we, we see this in the ancient world where two people would declare a covenant. They didn't have to be married. It could be just say two, two men who declared a covenant together and they basically became family. Like in that point in time, there was no separation of their flocks. There was no separation of their houses. There was no separation of their possessions. It's this idea that everything I have is yours irreversibly. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different thing than a contract where in a contract, you know, I, I write up a bill that says, I'm going to mow your lawn and you're going to pay me $20. Mm -hmm. and at the end of that contract, we walk away. Some mm -hmm. contracts may be I'm going to mow your lawn every day for the next 20 years or just ongoing. But mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a specific transactional based agreement, whereas mm -hmm. a covenant is a complete everything I have, I give to you. And when you look at the marriage vows and really listen to them, they aren't talking about a contract. There's none of this, I'll mow your lawn as long as you keep paying me my 20 bucks. No, it's <laughs> I give myself to you in complete for sickness and health and, and all of those different criteria, no matter what happens, I am yours. And yeah. that is a covenant. I think when they sign that paper at the end when they're getting married, I think that is, that is probably the part that, that confuses them and they think it's a contract. Because long Absolutely. ago, in the, in the years before, they didn't have anything to sign as far as I remember. It was you know, you're a good fit for me, I'm a good fit for you, you know, we could do things together. There wasn't anything. They might have had a nice little ceremony, you know, nothing major, not like how oh, you have marriages now, you know, this big hell of a thing. It was pretty simple. Families come together, you know, they witness it, they celebrate, they're there to support you, they're there to, to, to give you advice, counsel, that type of thing. We don't have that anymore. It's, it's more of, I see you, Michael, I'm in love with you. You know, we get married. Yeah, we have this big hullabaloo kind of a wedding. People come, eat us out, bring gifts and everything. But there's no, but there's no advice. We run off on our own. We're away from family, friends, you know, people who hold the heads, who could give us that sort of support during our time of merger. That's not happening, you know, like, like yesteryears. And so it, it has True. taken on a contractual um, type of thing. You were supposed to do this. You promised to do this. And, and then you come to me, Corinne, you were supposed to do that. You promised to do that. What the hell is that? <laughs> Amen, sister. I think you're right on some there. Yeah. 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 It's, it's crazy. I mean, you, you watch these shows on TV that show you covenant and you read in the Bible about covenant and, you know, when God was giving covenants to people, it was pretty simple. He didn't sit down and draft out a contract and say, I'm writing this thing out and this is what you have to sign to. Come and sign it here. Put your fingerprint or put your ink on this. And <laughs> it was nothing like that. Pretty simple. And, and you know, what just came to my mind, Michael, is that people were more, I, I'm searching for the word, probably you can help me out. People were more authentic, I think, at that mm. time than now. Yeah, I think so. I think they had a deeper sense of meaning, maybe yeah. as well, I'll say, yeah. where they understood that things matter and that things are difficult. And we shouldn't have give something up just because it's difficult. But mm. there's this idea maybe of continuity as well. Like, I think part of that comes also from understanding history. The more we understand as people how connected we all are yeah. through time to each other, the more we then also start to understand the importance of doing things that are meaningful and doing things that yeah. matter, even if they are hard. Yeah, the morals and the values were more, the discipline was mm -hmm. more there. That sort of, um, the, word is, is, the word is just escaping me, but there's a sense of, I don't know, um, realness that, that used to happen in, in, in those times. Oh gosh, I don't know why the word isn't coming to me, but I, I, I can... 
I, I'm, I'm trying to explain myself. It's like, you know, people now are just genuine. not, yeah, they're not as genuine. They're not, they're not, um, oh gosh, they're, they're just. I think people now are a little more focused on pleasing themselves a little yeah. more. I want what I want when I want it. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it is sad, you know, but I also want to point out that I think we're starting to see the beginnings of a little bit of a springing back because yeah. I, you see this in the millennials where the millennials aren't buying the same societal lies in the same way. Yeah. Some of them are, but a lot of them are starting to sense, you know, I, I need something deeper here. Yeah. There's, something, there's something my heart is calling for something that, ha that has... Searching. They're searching. Matters. They're searching, exactly. That searching is out there and they don't know what they're searching for yet. Mm -hmm. But... The, what, what humans now are basically the same as we've been for many thousands of years. They're the same type of creature. And for thousands of years, our society worked with this idea of meaning and virtue and mm -hmm. doing the right thing mm -hmm. and taking care of the weak and being strong in a, in a good, certain good way. And those things kind of seem like they're lost right now. But I think they're going to be starting to come back around again. Mm hmm You mentioned a word virtue, and that's, I think, the word I'm looking for. People are more virtuous at that time they were more solid they they you know you could i can say hey michael um i see you have some cows over there and i have some goats over here i think we would do well together and you'll be like yeah you know and 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 your word is your bond yes you know, that that is i think what i'm searching for your word is your bond and that is really really critical my right. goodness yeah oh you were saying something go ahead mm -hmm. You know, I, I think virtue is such a great word. And I, I've got a quick little one-liner that I love to tell people when they're squirming about the word virtue. The opposite of the word virtue is, of course, the word vice. And so when people say, oh, I don't know about virtues, I say, well, the opposite is vice. Would you like to be more vicious? Yeah. That's where that word comes from. And so when yeah. you think about it that way, virtue starts to look pretty good. <laughs> oh, my God. Great way. Great way to end off this show. I've said that before, but I'm saying it again. Michael, it's been an honor having you on the show. I'm Karine, it was fantastic. Noise. Yeah, I'm hearing some noise coming up around me now outside. So I want to, I don't want it, too much of it coming into the program. But nevertheless, we have shared some really great points and had a fabulous discussion as usual on marriage. So anyone listening to this, watching this, I hope they're able to take away a number of stuff and, and really take the time. Don't rush into something that you're not ready for. There's nobody having a clock or you're not in a race, you're not in a marathon, you're not, you know. Just take your time. Just take your time and, and get to know you. Make sure that you're 100%. Make sure the other person's at 100%. Make sure you're willing to share your resources, et cetera. Just, just take your time. No rush. Any final words from you, Michael? I think the last thing I'd offer for people is to take the risk to be vulnerable, to be genuine, to be authentic. It's, it's not safe. It's not comfortable, but when we choose to be real, vulnerable, authentic people to show our true selves, even if you're not yet married, if you're in the dating process, show who you really are, both spouses, take that risk, because either it will quickly shake out this isn't the right one and you need a different merger, or it'll set the stage for hopefully a marriage that has meaning and is real through its whole duration. Yeah, yeah. I noticed some changes on your website, Michael. I always like to feature the website. I noticed that you've really pumped up your website. Let me see here now. Remind me of it again. Uh, so we, we have a couple. I'm going to send you first of all to thestakesarehigh.com. And that, that's kind of the first one. That's the one I looked at, yeah. Yep. So we, we're, we're kind of actually, it's funny, my wife and I are getting ready to launch a few new things. It's a little early yet. I've got a book that's in the works I'm trying to get put together. And so we've got some fun yeah. stuff coming up. Oh, come tell me about that so that people can... Let me bring you down here. So. And there you are. There I am. That's me. Hey, <laughs> maybe you're right. Maybe there's a handsome looking guy sitting right I'm there. Oh, my God. Were you doubting me? I'm telling you. Yes, that guy there is pretty handsome with his nice boots on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife chose those. She likes those too. Yeah, nice. I need to meet your wife. Mm, she has good taste. So, you know, the only problem with that is you'll like her better than me. She's a nicer person than I am. So then I need to cut you off the show and bring her on the show. That's what I need. To <laughs> that, that, would be, uh, that would be a good choice, yeah. <laughs> so tell me what's going on with this. The stakes are high. So, so the concept behind the stakes are high is 
this is kind of my challenge that I give primarily to other fathers and men and husbands, but really to all of us to say, it's very easy to live a life in the drift, to just drift along, doing the thing we're supposed to do. You go to the events, you watch TV, but it's much harder to find something that's meaningful. And it feels as you're going through that you're just trying to survive every day. I heard a great thing the other day, you know, the years may go by quickly, but the days can last forever. And yeah. as you're in that day that lasts forever, it's so easy just to drift through. But the reality is the stakes are high, not just for our children, which obviously when we step back intellectually, we know that what we do determines so much for them, not just for our marriages, which even more so as we just got done talking about now, mm -hmm. it's so important, but even for ourselves mm -hmm. and the person whom we become yeah is the person who we have to be for the rest of our lives. And the stakes are a lot higher than we like to think. And what we do does matter. And so we have to choose either to fight or not to fight. And my goal with this particular project is to give people some really practical steps for how do you stay in the fight and keep going. Yeah, and I see you have some tabs here so you can go on the leadership, spiritual growth, marriage and fatherhood, really great topics. Yeah. So, so these are interviews, your podcast. Uh, some of them are interviews. Some of them are practical. Uh, yep, we happen to have a couple of interviews that came through recently. Um, sometimes I'll take a topic. Uh, actually, I'm about to put out a podcast here a little bit. My next one is just a little mini pitch. I'm going to be talking about a concept that is called a meadow report, which talks about how men and women are different and how they want to communicate and why it is that a woman wants to spend 15 minutes describing every detail and a man doesn't want to describe it and what the reasons behind that are. And most importantly of all, what can we do to find connection that honors and builds upon our differences rather than causes us to fight over them? That is a fabulous topic. And yes, I will agree that we want to spend 15 minutes talking about it. Okay. <laughs> That's just what it is. And the men just need to sit down and listen. That's all. Very good. It's pretty simple. Nothing to fight about. <laughs> just sit down and listen. <laughs> What's the other website you wanted me to have a look at? Um, I'm going to actually send you also, I think, over to uh, my wife's website right now. It's a sterlingjakewith.com. And a lot of her okay. projects we're working on together. J-A-Q-U-I-T-H. Oh, uh, no, no C in there. Perfect. Oh, like your name. I call it Jacquit. Oh, but yeah, this is no C. J-A-Q-U-I-T-H. Mm-hmm. And then dot com. So this is my wife's website. Nice. And we've got a couple different projects coming up here. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's her. That's her. That's my beautiful girl. <laughs> Saint in training. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And Saint in training. I love her already. <laughs> Catholic convert. Wow, nice. Author speak on Saint in training. And I love the yellow jacket. Oh gosh, that's so booming. I love it. Okay, so tell me what she has going on. So we've got some different books. We've got some different programs. She just launched a cute little book journal combination. And this is why I'm sending us here right now, specifically for people who aren't married yet. And so there's two parts to this. There's a book, which she calls Smitten, which is stories for, of Catholic love stories, basically. Mm -hmm. um, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll find Smitten down towards the bottom. And she just launched a journal right now. Mm -hmm. that is designed to go with it. And it's a journal that goes through what single ladies can be doing on their path to mm -hmm. finding a good marriage. And so there's a promotional, whoops, yeah, no, pop up. there's a promotional married. going on right now mm -hmm. to combine Smitten and this new journal out in a great deal together. And nice. so the journal is called Into the Wilderness. Nice. How to avoid anxiety during the holidays and advent like a boss. <laughs> nice. Oh, it's, it's crazy to think how, you know, holidays when people are supposed to have so much joy and excitement, they're actually having anxiety coming over to the family house. I'm like, what the hell is your anxiety about? I don't have anxiety. Well, no, I probably do not. I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> we all do, Karina. We all do. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm thinking from a single perspective, you know, I, my anxiety would be, yeah, you probably don't have anybody to spend time with and, you know, everybody has somebody and they're all hugging up by the fire. Well, we don't have the fire thing here, but, you know, they're going out and you see all these couples that are, you oh, know, yeah. just 
just get to you. You know, you have your own anxieties, but then, you know, you just have to say to yourself, hey, this is what it is right now. They were single at one point. Hmm. Mm -hmm. They were single at one point. So she has some stuff going on here. Yes, this is a big one. Catholic mom challenge. Jesus. Hmm. I think just, just having a mom challenge is, is big. So worse again. That's for sure. Catholic mom. Yeah. So she has been busy. Yes, she my wife is been, prolific. Yes, she has been busy. Not of this world. I like that. Yes. A Catholic guide to minimalism. Nice. She has been busy. You have a fabulous wife there. Let's come back to her. I really do. Yes, you need to be thankful. You need to be thankful, Michael. <laughs> I'll tell her you said that and you'll be her new favorite person. Yes, you need to be thankful. She's a beauty. She's a beauty. Oh my God. I can see both of you all matching. Look at that. She has more, she has more hair than you. Yeah, that's well. Here's the funny story about that. <laughs> all of our children have been born with a full head of hair. I kid you not. They come on out and they've got a full head of hair. And every time I lose some, for those who can't see right now, obviously, you know, I'm, I, I've lost everything from eyebrows up to past the midpoint now. And <laughs> at first I was getting bothered about that, but I thought, you know what? I have beautiful children. And if that's the price I pray to give them that beauty, I'll take it. That's the job of the man. That's I'm right. Kidding, that's I'm kidding. Right. But. That's the way to look at it. If that's the price you got to pay to have beautiful, wonderful children, healthy, vibrant, yeah, hey, Absolutely. there's nothing wrong with losing the hair and the eyebrows. And hey, bald is in, Michael. Bald is in. That's right. Bald is in. Mm. I'm a trendsetter. <laughs> Michael, oh my goodness. This has been a pleasure as usual. It's it's an honor finally at least seeing your wife and seeing what she's doing. So clearly she needs to get on my show so that she can talk about her own stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll get you connected. Yes, that would be, that would be awesome. Thank you so much. So thank you for being on Between the Lines, Michael. It's been a pleasure to have you here for the second time around. And I know it will not be the last. Thank you. Kareen, it was fantastic. And I really appreciate it.